Hello. We had a wonderful seminar today given by Ambassador Dr. Eng Sai Khan that I would like to share with you. Dr. Eng Sai Khan is an impressive Mongolian diplomat and a scholar. I found out about his work when researching Mongolian foreign policy and in that field you will necessarily come across his name as he has written many academic articles especially on theory and practice of international relations, security policy of great powers and small states and international legal issues. Ambassador Eng Sai Khan received his PhD in international law from the Moscow State Institute for International Relations. He started working for the Mongolian Ministry of Foreign Affairs in 1974, worked at the permanent mission of Mongolia to the UN between 1978 and 86. He became the deputy chief of mission of the Mongolian embassy to the USSR and later Russia from 88 to 92. He served as foreign policy legal advisor to the first democratically elected president of Mongolia and as executive secretary of the National Security Council. Between 1996 and 2003, he served as ambassador and permanent representative of Mongolia to the UN. From 2008 to 2012, he was Mongolia's ambassador to Austria and the permanent representative of the International Atomic Energy Agency in Vienna. Currently, Dr. Eng Sai Khan is heading the Mongolian NGO Blue Banner, which promotes nuclear non-proliferation and Mongolia's initiative to become a single state nuclear weapons free zone. And with this out of the way, please enjoy his talk. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Nowadays, you know, you can join uh, any time of the day uh, in such uh, uh, discussions. Uh, I would like to say uh, first uh, a few introductory words, just to, uh, to let you know what I will be talking about before we go to the uh, PowerPoint presentation. Mongolia is a non-nuclear weapon state, promotes uh, good neighborly relations with all the countries of, of the world, and bars, bans the use of uh, uh, its territory against interests of other states. That is very important now. As you all might know, Mongolia is situated between two nuclear weapon states, but promotes a policy of non-proliferation and greater involvement of non-nuclear weapon states in uh, international relations, especially in re uh, issues to, uh, related with nuclear uh, danger, prohibiting and hopefully uh, even abolishing nuclear weapons sometime in the future. One of the effective contributions of non-nuclear weapon states has been establishing of nuclear weapon free zones. However, there are cases when even non-nuclear weapon states cannot be part of regional nuclear weapon free zones. In which case, security in numbers does not apply. In regional nuclear weapon free zones, the security numbers applies. But when you're alone, individual country, that does not apply. That means that dozens of states, mainly small, small states, would not be able to strengthen their security through, through joint regional efforts like other members of nuclear weapon free zones. There is a legal gap in international law on this issue that creates nuclear blind spots and gray areas that must be addressed so that in the future, we would, no one would try to fish in strategic advantages in uncharted waters, so, so to say. There are this uh, blind spot and gray areas. That is why my talk today is on developing legal norms of single state nuclear weapon free zones with my country, Mongolia, being so far the only one to have raised and pursued this issue. I would like to say that, uh, uh, that the views expressed uh, in this lecture are those of the Blue Banner NGO and does not necessarily reflect the views of Mongolian government. With that introductory work, uh, words, I would like to now uh, start uh, the uh, our presentation. The presentation. It's uh, co-named Mongolia's quest for a single state nuclear weapon free zone norm. 
Okay, now we want to turn to the second. Uh, Pascal, can you help me? Yes, you the, just the second one now. Just click on the um, arrow, the arrow key, the next key. On on the um, on your keyboard. I did. I did. Okay. Okay. Click once on the screen. Just on the Mongo. Yeah. Just click once there. Okay. Thank you very much. I hope. Uh, yeah. Yes. Now the first uh, one is about the nuclear uh, horizon. What is now today? As you all know, the doomsday clock is a symbol that represents, as they say, the likelihood of uh, a man-made global catastrophe connected with unchecked scientific and technical advances. Last year, the arm of the uh, doomsday clock was moved closer to the midnight, uh, 100 minutes to midnight. That means it's a stark warning that we are uh, close to a global catastrophe. There are always two uh, sides of any issues. I will try to cover both sides as well. The number of uh, nuclear weapon states have, nuclear weapons have declined. In 1986, there were about 70,000. Now today we have 13,400. Yet the risk of their use is increasing. Why? First, because the weakened of NPT regime. Even some uh, states' parties to the NPT regime are not uh, uh, following up to their obligations. Then this, the abrogation of ABM, INF, and uh, uh, Open Skies treaties. Then there's also further uh, modernization of existing weapons. Also introduction of space weapons. It is believed that whoever controls the space controls the Earth. And since, since space weapons can increase also operational effectiveness of weapons systems. There are other systems as, as well, in, uh, getting it wrong. Cyber weapons, artificial intelligence, we all know quantum technologies and other new weapons and systems and related, of course, doctrines to that. There's no agreement on those issues yet. Unfortunately, action reaction logic drives new weapons development and deployment that leads to for further arms race. As you might know, in 2019, the world has spent $1.9 trillion for arms purchase, of which 100 billion for nuclear arms expenses. But I, as I said, on the other hand, there are some positive signs. I will just enumerate briefly. Extension of the New START Treaty, just a couple of weeks ago, entry into force of the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, and renewed debate on the merits of non-first use and so on and so forth. I don't think I need to dwell on that because you know it's always in the press, it's written. Now, where the world is now, now we have nine nuclear weapon states and still a risk of increase of, of the number of states. Today, more than 30 uh, states rely on extended nuclear deterrence for their security. The good news, on the other hand, is that the role of nuclear weapon state, uh, non-nuclear weapon states is increasing. You know that uh, uh, some NATO members like Iceland, Denmark, and Norway restrict port visits of nuclear capable uh, naval units in peacetime. Since the mid 1970s, Norway itself banned port visits of all ships carrying nuclear weapons. So that's, a, I think, a very uh, positive sign. Then uh, many international organizations have been uh, very active in promoting nuclear non-proliferation and uh, nuclear security. I will not uh, uh, name all of them, but I can say that in 1985, it was IPPNW, the, the, the doctor's organization. 1995, Pugwash Conference received a Nobel Peace Prize. 
1997 international campaign to ban uh, uh, landmines and uh, just three years ago, international campaign to abolish nuclear weapons also received the nuclear, uh, nuclear uh, uh, Nobel Prize. Uh, also, there's increase in uh, grassroots uh, movements. The uh, best example is Mayors for Peace, which has uh, 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 supporters in uh, about 7,000 cities in 65 countries. Now, uh, I would like to say that uh, the amount of money that I mentioned about 1.9 trillion could have been and needs to be uh, spent on other issues of global pandemic and so on and so forth, climate change and so on. There are a lot of uh, NGOs, international and national NGOs are trying to uh, promote uh, this uh, idea. I think that is very uh, important. Uh, so that's where we are today at this stage. Nuclear weapon free zones. As you might know, nuclear weapon free zones is a practical contribution to non-proliferation and confidence building. This is a regional approach that underlines strength in numbers of non-nuclear weapon states and strengthens mutual confidence. The main elements of nuclear weapon free zones are conclusion of regional treaties not to acquire nuclear weapons in that region, regional verification mechanism, and the third important thing is acquiring uh, nuclear uh, security assurances from the five nuclear weapon states that are reflected as nuclear weapon states in the NPT uh, uh, document treaty. The basic uh, nuclear weapon free zone legal documents are as of today, the five treaties, regional treaties that uh, all 118 states have already uh, signed among each other. And uh, which is very important. And the second part is also the five nuclear weapons uh, states providing security assurances to them. Nuclear weapon free zone is not a panacea in itself. Just because you have a nuclear weapon free zone does not mean that you know that you, that you have uh, addressed all your problems. There are strengths and weaknesses. I will just uh, touch upon them very briefly. What are the strengths and weaknesses so that you will have a more better perception of uh, nuclear weapon free zones. Strength is that they are practical measures for uh, non-proliferation and confidence building, which is important. Why confidence building? Because to these countries, they don't have nuclear weapons. So it is important for confidence building. The second is, is uh, the non-station of nuclear weapons on the territories of countries or on the territory of the nuclear weapon free zone. And three, again, legal by the security assurances by the nuclear weapon states. There are a number of shortcomings. And we have to bear that in mind. Nuclear uh, weapons, uh, let's say, carriers through a territory, through a nuclear weapon free zone territory. It is optional. Without that, the, the nuclear weapon states would not have provided security assurances to them. So it is optional. So far. Uh, is not an IEA related uh, the country does not want to be uh, uh, years in advance uh, notification and then they would be able just to, to uh, leave uh, the, the zone itself. Then the security assurances that nuclear weapon states are, are provide are very, very heavily conditional. They don't say that they don't use, will not use or threaten to use nuclear weapons against such a, a nuclear weapon free zones. They say they, they will not do that unless they are not, uh, let's say, in alliance with a, other, another nuclear weapon state that might, you know, uh, try to use force against that state or the, the alliance of that state or uh, against a, a state with which a nuclear weapon country has a security let's say, uh, agreement, let's, let, let's say, 
uh, Austria, uh, Australia or uh, Japan or uh, South Korea. And uh, today's uh, uh, regime are based on the premise of strength in numbers. I'm un underlining that because when it comes to individual countries, it does not apply so far. And that's what we're trying to do to focus on this. The achievement so far, Comparatively easy nuclear weapon free zones have been established. There are five nuclear weapon free zones, as you might know, uh, and, um, and which uh, has 180 states parties to those uh, five zones, 40% of the world population, 50% of the Earth's surface, and 60% of UN membership. That shows that, you know, that it has a lot of uh, support within the international community. Now the question is of the second generation of nuclear weapon free zones to be established. Those are the regions of tension or where interest of uh, nuclear weapon states or great powers are at stake. There are three now at this stage. The Middle East, where confidence building and non-proliferation are needed the most. Northeast Asia, I shall come back to that later on and the Arctic, which is increasingly becoming with the, the uh, changes in uh, uh, the environment, it is increasingly becoming an area of geopolitical, geoeconomic, and geoecological interest. The latest information on Arctic uh, situation can be found in December, 2020, uh, issue of Global Asia. That uh, issue was dedicated specifically to this question, saying that we should not, uh, you know, we should focus on this issue at this time without wasting much time on this. However, what, what, however, completely overlooked is the interest and role of individual states. A situation that if ignored would create nuclear blind spots in gray areas in, nuclear, in the nuclear weapon free world. Even though the UN study as far back as in 1975 had underlined that even individual states, even one state can establish nuclear weapon free zones. So far only Mongolia has been raising this issue. Mongolia's case. People might wonder why Mongolia all of a sudden? Well, Mongolia is a country with a big territory and a small population and sandwiched or uh, situated between uh, Russia and China, two nuclear weapon uh, states. And it also has an experience, a past experience shows them that Mongolia wants to be as active as possible, not only in foreign policy, but in, in nuclear related issues as well. Mongolia was influenced by double Cold Wars, East-West and Sino-Soviet. So we were in a very, very uh, tight situation. So as Soviet ally, it hosted Soviet bases, bases mean nearly 70,000 uh, troops, two tank and two motorized rifle divisions, and the unspecified number of Air Force units, some of them with dual use weapons, meaning that weapons that can be used as conventional weapons or even nuclear weapons. Mongolia also witnessed about 20, about 27% of all nuclear weapon tests in its vicinity, not in Mongolia itself, but it's in, in its vicinity in China and in the Soviet Union at that time. Now I'd like to say briefly a few words about the bitter lesson that we have learned. Sino-Soviet border clashes in 1969 over Damanske Island in the Usuri River claimed more than 1,000 soldiers on both sides, deaths. The Soviets briefly entertained the idea at that time of making a preemptive strike against Chinese nuclear installations and some other targets. Archival materials being made uh, public now 
indicate that the Soviet uh, not only told their Warsaw Pact allies about their intention, possible intention, but also approached the United States as the second superpower to know its reaction to its uh, declawing, or the, the, at, at that time they used to write castrating the rising dragon. The US reaction was against it and said that it would consider such an act as a beginning of World War III. That response most probably forced the Soviets to think over again their action. My generation still remembers that at that time in uh, the late 1960s, world press was widely reporting on China digging many tunnels in case of Soviet attack and dispersing their weapons, especially nuclear weapons. If there would have been an expanded, let's say, uh, military conflict, perhaps even with the use of nuclear weapons, surely Mongolia would have been the first, if not the most uh, suffered country. Now, uh, with the lessons uh, of 1969, just uh, uh, very briefly. The lessons were learned from the 1969 event was that if push comes to a shove, great powers will not fight directly with each other, but will take, make use of their allies or proxies. Danger of reliance of uh, one state only for security, that is a danger. Alliance with a nuclear weapon state and hosting the latter's basis makes the country a legitimate military target of other states, especially of other nuclear weapon states. That's what we felt. Then uh, also important side of diversifying one's foreign relations. You cannot be only on good terms with one country ignoring other countries. You have to diversify and have as many uh, countries supporting, understanding, working with you. Of course, there's also the rejection of Monroe or Brezhnev doctrines of limited sovereignty. And what is uh, also important is drawing your own red lines that would, uh, pro would not provide any pretext for others uh, for, to make a military uh, incursion into you. You have to have your own uh, uh, red lines making sure that you do not uh, give any, provide any pretext for other countries to threaten or to use force against you. Now changes with the end of the Cold War. What are, were the key changes that you know, uh, affected us? First is that normalization of Sino-Russian relations and their agreement not to use territories of uh, neighboring third states against each other. That means Mongolia. That means that they will not use Mongolian territory to harm the interest of the other country of yours. Then the withdrawal of Russian bases and conclusion by Mongolia with, uh, with its uh, neighbors, treaties on friendly relations and cooperation with both of them. Pursuing Mongolia's foreign policy based primarily on its own vital interests, balancing relations with the neighbors. And what is new is promoting third neighbor policy to bring in other countries to Mongolia to work with us, to cooperate with us, so as to counterbalance the weight of its relations with the two neighbors. The third neighbor policy is very important, was and still is. Then the other change was non-alignment policy. Before we were allied with the Soviet Union, now we're pursuing a non-aligned policy, especially neutrality in future possible Russian or Chinese disputes that do not affect directly Mongolian, uh, Mongolia's vital interests. If they would affect our uh, uh, 
uh, vital interests, we will follow those interests. And we will let the Russians and the Chinese know that. Much will depend on their policy towards us. But what we want uh, to do right now is to be neutral, not to allow our territory to be uh, used one against another. Based on that, we are now promoting a proactive uh, foreign policy. We in Mongolia follow an adage that says that duck is calm when the lake is calm. We consider ourselves like you know, a, a small uh, duck in the lake. Hence, active foreign policy and promoting security primarily by political and diplomatic means. Not alliance, but uh, promoting security by uh, political and diplomatic uh, means. And then also, when we were an ally of the Soviet Union, we uh, mostly ignored the international practice and the international uh, law thinking that what is good for, for the Soviet Union was good for Mongolia. Now this is, the situation has changed. So uh, we are trying to uh, support and recognize the primacy of international law, however weak it is. But most of the smaller countries are support of, uh, of strengthening of uh, international law. That's why we accepted the jurisdiction of International Court of Justice which we, we did not do that uh, during the Cold War. We were following the Soviet example. We became part of, of uh, the International Criminal Court, one of the first members of the International Criminal Court. And we began participating very actively in peacekeeping operations as contribution to common goal. Uh, Mongolia's, uh, Mongolia does not have a strong uh, let's say army, it's the 128th in the world, but in peacekeeping operations, it's the 27th. We're serving in, in Asia and in Africa, very distinctively. And the UN Secretary Generals have always expressed you know, their satisfaction and uh, support for our active peacekeeping operations. And then, as I have said, you know, we uh, it, uh, witnessed 27% uh, of nuclear weapon tests. Now we're party to the CTBTO and uh, host four important uh, stations in Mongolia. Primary seismic, infrasound, radionuclide, and noble gas. So this is, we're, we're, we're trying to be as active as possible in that sense. Now, Mongolia declares its territory a nuclear weapon free zone. Just a very briefly. You see here the, the, the picture of our president. President uh, Ochebat declared in 1992 the country a single state nuclear weapon free zone and has committed, not just declared, but also committed to have that status internationally guaranteed. Because a statement is one thing, but get a commitment by the nuclear weapon states to provide us with assurance is very important. That was in line with the policies of many non-nuclear weapon states that had been, that, uh, had been uh, very active. At that time in 1992, there were at already two active nuclear weapon free zones in Latin America and South Pacific. Two were underway under discussion in Southeast Asia and Africa. And of course, a joint statement of the two Koreas to, to denuclearize the peninsula. And they have signed a joint statement in, in that regard. So when making the declaration, Mongolia was also aware or mindful of the 1975 UN report on nuclear weapon free zones that underlined the possibility of establishing nuclear weapon free zones by one or by uh, individual states. That was also gave us uh, some uh, support that we should pursue this uh, issue at that time. As you might know that in 1975, the General Assembly has adopted a definition of nuclear weapon free zones and definition focused on regional or group zones, a number of countries establishing uh, nuclear weapon free zones. But at the same time, the, gen the General Assembly 
uh, underline that a group zone definition in no way impairs the resolutions which the General Assembly had adopted or may adopt in the future on, regarding specific cases like Mongolia's cases as well, and the rights of that country as a nuclear weapon free zone. So this is very, was very important uh, to, to decide for us to go and become a nuclear weapon free zone based on our past experience of uh, being you know, targeted by other countries. Now, international reaction to Mongolia's decision. First, uh, I'm talking about the, the P5 because they are the most important countries when we discuss issues of uh, nuclear weapons. The P5 welcomed the initiative, good news, but made known that they would not support its promotion since that would set a precedent and detract from establishing other new regional zones. Mongolia requested for P5 support in the form a joint of a joint statement. There was a, what is known a football game in that sense. Football means that uh, when you come go to one country, nuclear weapon country, they will say, well, we have no problems, but you have to discuss this, let's say, with uh, the US. When you go to US, they'll say, well, look at the map. <laughs> you should uh, speak to uh, the Russia and China. If they agree, then that, that's another thing. The smaller the two nuclear weapon states, Britain and France, the France uh, uh, would say, well, we have no problems, but you should look at uh, uh, the Francophone countries, more than 30 countries, and what would they think? They have not received security assurances from France, but uh, France is giving security assurances to Mongolia, which is far, far away. That was a lame excuse, of course, but I guess we will have to deal with that. And based on that, the Fr France said no, they cannot support uh, the joint statement. Other uh, uh, US allies were very evasive because most of the uh, uh, allies are non-nuclear weapon states, but at the same time, they're allies with the United States. So their uh, response was, well, it's a very difficult issue. It's something new. We have to consider this ourselves with our allies and so on and so, so forth. On the other hand, there were positive, sympathetic and uh, support, reactions and support by most nuclear weapon states, non-nuclear weapon states. Why I say most? Because the, uh, the allies of uh, nuclear alliances were numb in that sense. They were not uh, uh, positive. On the other hand, we received full support from the non-aligned movement, the five nuclear weapon uh, uh, zones, and uh, such organizations like a Shanghai uh, Cooperation Organization, ARF, provided uh, support in principle. Now turning to the United Nations. Since the uh, five nuclear weapon states turned down our request for a supportive uh, joint statement, Mongolia turned to the United Nations Disarmament Commission for political support. Why to that commission? Because at that time, that commission was uh, considering the issue of establishment new uh, nuclear weapon uh, free zones. However, the, the five nuclear weapon states were against consideration of the issue in the commission, even as, as a concept. We said that, okay, we, let, we can start with a concept. And if we agree on concept, we can turn to Mongolia. But they said that they cannot uh, accept that as a concept. Uh, and that, that, that uh, considering this issue would distract the international community from considering establishment of other regional group nuclear weapon free zones. When we reminded about Latin America, in case it fell on deaf ear. They said that it, it was another issue and 
you cannot, you know, mix, uh, let's say, Latin American nuclear weapon free zone with, uh, let's say, the concept of, new, of single state nuclear weapon free zones. So we agreed to come back to this issue at some later stage. When we asked when, they said, well, that will depend on the, the situation and so on and so forth. With the P5 blocking the issue at United Nations Disarmament Commission, Mongolia went directly to the United Nations uh, General Assembly's first committee and proposed a draft resolution on, Mongolia's, on Mongolia mentioning the zone as a single state nuclear weapon free zone and uh, the issue of institutionalizing. We got a, a swift reaction from the five, three nuclear weapon states. Brit, uh, US, Britain, and France. They made a joint demarche saying that any attempt for a legal status would be premature, unhelpful, and even possibly counterproductive. When we asked uh, what happened to Russia and, and China, they said, well, they are your neighbors and they don't want to be involved in that. But I guess so. Because we have uh, bilateral treaties with Russia and China where, whereby you know, they support our uh, issue in that time. Though at that time, the non-aligned movement had indicated that they would uh, provide full support and vote in favor of, of a resolution on Mongolia, Mongolia decided to work mainly with the five nuclear weapon states. Why? Because we need their security assurances. So we uh, said, thank you, that we would not go for a vote. We don't want a pyrrhic victory. We want this issue to move slowly, but nevertheless uh, forward. So based on that, we uh, negotiated with uh, the, the P5, the uh, resolution of 1998. Uh, I'm sure that if, if, if those who are uh, interested can always find the resolution. And the resolution did, did not welcome Mongolia's nuclear weapon free status. They welcomed Mongolia's declaration and they welcomed Mongolia's efforts. They, the five nuclear weapon states did not want to go beyond that because they knew that according to the General Assembly, a definition of nuclear weapon free zones, if they welcomed the nuclear Mongolian issue, that would mean that they uh, recognize Mongolia as a special case to which they would have to provide security assurances. So the resolution was a very uh, uh, positive step, but nevertheless, the, the five nuclear weapon states did not support the zone concept and thus institutionalizing it. Now, a uh, few words about promoting Mongolian status. First things first, Mongolia in February 2000 adopted national legislation. You cannot have a policy based on General Assembly resolution only. You have to uh, give an example by adopting a legislation, national legis legislation on the issue, making sure that, that nuclear weapon free status of Mongolia is regulated by law in Mongolia, that it becomes part of, uh, uh, of national law. And that legislation was based on the treaties that, that I think I uh, mentioned the five treaties of nuclear weapon free zones. The main elements of those treaties were put in the legislation so that the five nuclear weapon states will not be able to say, well, they cannot do this and that. Before adoption of the resolution, they said it was very important that you we adopt the legislation. But when we adopted the legislation, they said, well, it's your, uh, a sovereign affair, you can have a legislation, you can do whatever you want. We don't intervene in your uh, internal affairs. As if the human rights relate to issues, and there are different issues in, in that sense. So uh, promoting Mongolia's uh, things. Well, first, as I said, we have a, a national legislation. After that, Mongolia and the P5 discussed the content of possible assurance to Mongolia. 
it was difficult for them to say that they will not you know, provide us assurances, but the, the content and the form of assurance was very important. So we discussed this issue and we even proposed, let's say Budapest memorandum style you know, assurance that they have provided, let's say uh, Britain, uh, uh, US and uh, Russia provided to uh, Ukraine, uh, Belarus and Kazakhstan. We had uh, some good uh, discussions, but all of a sudden they said that they cannot do that. And then they came up with a joint statement saying that they will not uh, use nuclear weapons against Mongolia or, or even threaten to use nuclear weapons against Mongolia. Our reaction was polite. We said that it was uh, a positive step, yet it was done in the Cold War spirit and no legally binding assurances. And with that in mind, we started the, what we call right the wrong campaign at the United Nations. Most of the uh, non-nuclear weapon states, they were on our side, they supported it. So the five nuclear weapon states had to uh, make a gesture and they said, all right, let us discuss the issue at an informal meeting. What do we do next? Well, so we told them what we wanted from the nuclear weapon state is looking to the future, that they will not use Mongolian territory, do not pressure Mongolia to accept nuclear weapons or any parts of nuclear weapon systems. In the end, we have agreed to have an informal meeting in Sapporo, Japan, to discuss this issue. And in Sapporo, we came to an agreement that perhaps it would be possible to have a trilateral treaty, Mongolia, Russia, China, on Mongolia's nuclear weapon free status, to which the uh, nuclear weapon states could provide security assurances. Based on that, we have provided to Russia and China our draft resolution, draft uh, treaty and protocol. Uh, it was an eight page uh, draft. And we had uh, meetings with, uh, the, uh, with Russia and China in Geneva in 2009, two meetings. We discussed the content of possible treaty. And at the end of the second meeting, the, the Russians and the Chinese have said that if the US, China, uh, US uh, Britain and France cannot agree, then we will not be able to sign a treaty with you. On issues of security assurances, the five nuclear weapon states act hand in hand in tandem together. So they said that we have to speak to the, the US and France and, and, and Britain. We discussed with that and then they said that they will not be able to do that because that would set a precedent for many, many other countries as well. And they said that that will even set a precedent within the NATO alliance when small, small uh, country will say, okay, we're part of the NATO alliance, but in peacetime we will not accept nuclear weapons and so on. So forth. I can understand that, but they should also understand the Mongolia's uh, position in that sense. So that's uh, what's that. So in the end, we have agreed, we had meetings again, and we had agreed that instead of a treaty, they will sign the five countries, uh, nuclear weapon state will sign a joint declaration. That would uh, say that they would, that they would respect Mongolia's status and would not contribute to any act that would uh, violate it. This is the, the end of the story so far at this stage. All in all, it took us about 80 meetings with the P5, meetings in different uh, uh, formats, bilateral, trilateral, and with the P5. And in the end, uh, in, in uh, September uh, 2012, we were able to have them sign this joint, uh, joint declaration pledging that they will not you know, violate our status. We're almost there. Where we are, uh, are today and prospects, well, internationally, 
Mongolia has uh, a recognized status and the joint P5 uh, declaration promising that they will not uh, use Mongolia against each other. Yet still no legally uh, based security assurances, no fully institutionalized status. In the meantime, United Nations General Assembly has adopted 11 uh, resolutions on Mongolian issue because the issue is uh, considered every second year at the General Assembly. And each time the General Assembly expressed conviction that internationally recognized Mongolia's status would contribute to regional uh, stability and confidence building. Though the P5 themselves are co-sponsors of this resolution, they're against uh, the provision to welcome the, the Mongolia status. Again, saying that that would lead to accepting the status as a form of nuclear weapon free zone, which they are not uh, prepared to agree with at this stage. So that's where we are at this uh, stage. Uh, in short, Mongolia needs to have a general assembly at this stage, welcome the status so that it could acquire internationally uh, guaranteed secu uh, security assurances. But the P5 still do not want that. So there is a vicious circle there that needs some international push to further the process. In short, I would say that, that the work is still in progress. Now we uh, have, uh, I think, two more, two or three more slides. Uh, the importance and practical utility of six sing single state nuclear weapon free zones. As I have pointed out earlier, current practice of establishing regional zones leaves open the issue of single state nuclear weapon free zones that allows for nuclear blind spots and gray areas. That is a legal gap with serious practical implications. As is known, a chain is as strong as its weakest link and absence of duly recognized single state nuclear weapon zone is a weakest link in all this chain. Single state zones might be established, for example, in Nepal and Afghanistan. I'm saying that because I was at the United Nations, I was working with uh, their ambassadors at, 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 in the end of 1990s, and they were very, very much uh, interested in that. And there was an understanding that they will wait until Mongolia acquires legally based status. Otherwise the nuclear weapon states will say, well, we told you that you are uh, uh, creating uh, a destabilized uh, position precedent. But since uh, India and Pakistan have uh, become de facto nuclear weapon states in uh, 1998, some other South Asian states have also developed interest in this issue. Thus, an 11 article draft legislation has been uh, submitted to Bangladesh parliament for its consideration. In Sri Lanka, a strategically situated uh, state in Indian Ocean, idea is also being flagged in Australia to turn the, issue, the country into a single state nuclear weapon free zone. The history with its highly advertised Budapest memorandum, which, uh, to which I made a reference on security assurance, uh, has also shown that the political assurances can be easily violated. That is a reminder for states that political assurances cannot fully protect the interests of uh, assurance recipients. Further discussion of a six single state nuclear weapon free zone might, in due time, of course, encourage more members of political military alliances to ban nuclear weapons in their territories in peacetime and thus promote non-nuclear alliance, which would be in line with 
the demands of the General Assembly of the United Nations. It will not be easy, of course, but cannot be ruled out in the future once a process starts of discussing this issue. There is no guarantee that nuclear weapon states would not want to use territories of other non-nuclear weapon states and place, if not nuclear weapons themselves, then nuclear weapons related facilities so as to acquire political military advantages today when, the, when time and space are became, becoming determining military factors. Hence, there is a need to require the P5 make a joint statement, that's a proposal, on non-involvement of non-nuclear weapon states in nuclear weapon related activities. Small island states and non-self-government territories of which there are more than a dozen should not passively accept a risky fate, but require assurances from nuclear weapon states to refrain from setting up nuclear weapon related facilities or place parts of such facilities on their territories and thus drag them into a nuclear weapon arms race conflict or even confrontation. This is based on, on our, our lessons learned. Very briefly about Northeast Asian nuclear weapon free zone. Another issue that Blue Banner is involved in is promoting the idea of establishing a Northeast Asian nuclear weapon free zone. During the Cold War, North Korea and China had proposed to do denuclearize the Korean Peninsula. However, it was ignored as being a propaganda exercise uh, aimed to force withdrawal of US forces from South Korea, or at least uh, uh, nuclear weapons from South Korea. Most states of Northeast Asia technologically are nuclear capable ones. So any change in, in the region can start a domino effect. A dangerous dominant effect. The situation began to change with US withdrawal of uh, its nuclear weapons in 1991 from South Korea, followed by the signing by the two uh, uh, Koreas of uh, joint declaration on denuclearizing the peninsula. At the academic and think tank levels, proposals have been uh, made to establish a limited nuclear weapon free zone in Northeast Asia at three plus three formula, meaning three countries, uh, two, two Koreas, Japan as non-nuclear weapon country, and three countries providing security assurances, meaning US, Russia, and China. And then there's also the proposal uh, of a comprehensive approach to the issue, meaning it's not, not only the nuclear weapon free zone, but also uh, termination of state of war, let's say creation of permanent council and so on. So, so there are many such ideas at, at now. In 2013, UN Advisory Board on Disarmament recommended to the Secretary General to take action towards establishing a nuclear weapon free zone in Northeast Asia. That same year, Mongolia expressed its readiness on an informal basis to see if and how such a zone could be established. A number of regional NGO meetings followed, including held in uh, Ulaanbaatar, Mongolia. But there is still no practical move at governmental level to discuss them. In September 2020, an international NGO policy forum proposed to start a process to openly discuss how to promote a zone in which all stakeholders, including North Korea, which is important, would be, uh, could participate. Based on Mongolia's experience of promoting its nuclear weapon free status by starting a process thereon, Lubana believes that launching such a process could be of no less importance 
than the ultimate goal of establishing the zone. So we believe that, you know, that launching a process is very, very important at this stage. There are many ideas, but, you know, it's being discussed among, uh, let's say, scholars and think tankers, but no uh, participation of North Korea and so on and so forth. Now the last uh, conclusion. Nuclear threat affects us all. Everyone agrees. All should be contributors to security and not only consumers. That's what we believe. On the other hand, great power politics do not rule out involving individual states in their rivalries and conflicts. The nature of great powers do not change. Big or small stakeholders alike should try to contribute to common security based on each other's comparative advantages, geographical or other. Banning of use of territories to promote distrust or disrupt regional or global stability would be a big positive step contributing to common security. The importance of recognizing single state nuclear weapon free uh, zones. Regarding small island states and non self governing territories, Rubana believes that the P5 can make a joint statement on non use of their territories in nuclear weapons related activities and agree to some form of on demand uh, ver verifications. That would contribute greater to greater confidence and predictability. And last, if a small non-aligned state can contribute to promoting confidence and predictability, then surely larger states, especially allies that are close to nuclear weapon states, can contribute even more to reducing the common threat. And you see this uh, picture saying that you should never give up. Thank you very much. If there will be any interest, uh, the Bulban is ready to work with uh, anyone on this issue. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>